Therese is stuck on a shuttle, so she's on her way. Good morning. Sorry for the late start. We're good to go now. Uh, my name is Ken Sinclair. I'm uh, the uh, editor, owner, flounderer at uh, uh, Automated Buildings. This is our uh, 20th year of doing education sessions at uh, AHR uh, Expo. We have a relationship with them where they provide the room and uh, we provide the people and uh, the program. So it's worked out pretty well for us. Uh, it's helped expose our magazine a little bit and uh, it gives them some content and it uh, lets us connect you to some folks in the industry. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is smart building automation evolution and from Ethernet to Emotion. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we've been at this uh, automated buildings has been online for 20 years as well. And what we did is we, uh, at, on our 15th anniversary, we created with uh, Therese Sullivan's, who's uh, stuck in a shuttle bus, but it should probably be here before we're, uh, before we call on her to speak. Uh, so she prepared a collaboratory of what had happened in the first 15 years. And then I've picked that up and I've extended that for the next five years. And uh, Brad's uh, involvement in all of this is he came in at about the 10, 11 year mark and uh, has, uh, has sort of been involved in this evolution. So I think what I'm trying to do is trying to build a bridge between where we are right at this moment and where we are going today with some of our programs. And uh, uh, so I just want to step, step through that and uh, discuss. This is all online on the front page of our uh, website, automatedbuildings.com. Uh, the smart building evolution uh, is there. It's all done in a timeline and you can fly over it. It starts like this and uh, we, it's so, it's so old, we started and it was called the DDC industry. And of course, what we were doing in the early days is converting pneumatics to DDC. And uh, eventually that turned into smart building evolution. And we pasted all of that on a timeline uh, over the last 20 years. And you can spin over there and partic pick out particular events. So it's quite, quite useful. It's quite a, quite a good flyover of the uh, situation or situation of our evolution. Uh, it's also available in text if you actually click on the uh, uh, right hand uh, slide bar, it pops up with the what you're looking at and gives you a text uh, position of it. Also, if you take a look at it, it, uh, it has like a timeline and it shows all the various things that we thought were evolutionary bits along our evolution. Uh, so you can kind of click on it. So it's, it's a great way to, if you want somebody to quickly catch up on what happened in the last 20 years in building automation, this is a good, a good uh, start. And so each one of these tiles is, is active and uh, you click on it and it usually links to some article or resource on automatedbuildings.com. So it's, uh, it's a quick way of, first you can do a flyover and see what all of the pieces are, and then you can actually drill down and look at the pieces. And then what it does is it tends to drop you into the magazine at the era that you entered into the timeline. So you can see it starts with uh, a graph that uh, we were talking about the other day that uh, we, I ended up drawing up back in the early days because there wasn't such an existing thing to show uh, how we evolved from pneumatics to electrics to electronics to DDC and <coughs> onward to backnets and and all of those pieces and how we moved to IT uh, goes through the backnet story it goes through the KNX story uh, all of these things are outlined uh, on the uh, on this presentation the uh, <coughs> The other option it has is if you want to fly over the last 20 years really quick, uh, you only got six minutes to take a look at that or two minutes, uh, there's a little <laughs> button on the side of the display. Uh, this, this is all done on some software platform called Tiki Talk or something like that. It's an unusual name. But when you click over it, then it actually pops all of these tiles into a, a 3D mode and you can actually 
spin through and uh, and see all of the things happening. And if you get towards the last few years, you start to see us talking more and more about building a motion. And uh, we'll explain a little bit more about that. So it's it's a good resource. Is uh, you know like how did when did Ethernet uh, enter into our when did we switch over to Ethernet when did we uh, you know when when was KNX when was Dally when were all of these standards how did they fit in when did they start it's kind of just a quick quick reference and uh, I've got some good feedback people have uh, said that it's 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 a useful a useful demonstration or display. The building of motion is what our theme is for uh, th this uh, this year's AHR uh, education programs. We're using building a motion as both a noun and a verb. So building a motion, as it is a physical thing that we we're trying to uh, draw out of the buildings, we're trying to. Uh, of course, the building doesn't have a motion, but the people inside of it have a motion, and the building then reflects the emotion of the people. And we're starting to see that more and more in, in like Starbucks and uh, folks' lounges and stuff where they, they tend to pick a theme and they try to draw people in. And as our buildings are slowly moving more from uh, places of work and more like a hotel uh, environment, it becomes more important that the building has an emotion or a theme or an involvement with the people. The other thing we've been talking about is building whisperers, which uh, is an interesting concept, is the people who actually uh, have, have an inside uh, view of the buildings and they want to, uh, to make it a lot, a lot better. They want to relate to the people. We're all chasing that productivity piece uh, our workforce is radically changing the way they come to work uh, or even if they do come to work is a different uh, a different scenario than than the old work model and we need to understand how how they have set that up we we're seeing a trend in large office buildings that uh, the bigger companies are not building new office buildings they're repurposing their old office buildings and using them more and more as this hoteling kind of concept. And so all of a sudden we have to deal with the people completely different and we have the technologies to do that. And uh, this, this particular drawing was uh, started by my 12-year-old uh, 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 granddaughter and I asked her what, uh, what building a motion would look like and we agreed that it would have to involve a building and it would have to involve a person because they're the only thing that could have a emotion and it would involve an edge where all of this would occur. So she went away and in 15 minutes came up with this on a uh, pad and uh, emailed it to me. It was in black and white. <clears throat> I posted it on our website. Uh, the folks in Singapore picked it up and colored it and added these words to it. I think that's kind of a quick demonstration of how, you know, how uh, susceptible our industry is to some kind of uh, portray of uh, a virtual, virtual, virtual environment. So the building emotion, as if we don't look at it as a noun, we can also look at it as a verb, and it's like a task we have to do is we have to build emotion and, and create this relationship. I see it also as a new architectural fabric that we need to, uh, to spread over. Now we just did a session yesterday, and uh, unfortunately <coughs> Lawrence was unable to uh, uh, make it from the UK, so Brad and I uh, did that session. Uh, what Lawrence was able to do is he put together a podcast, and he uh, so uh, Lawrence and I both speak to the uh, the building emotion, and uh, that's on our it's not on our website yet because it was just done yesterday, but it is on our Twitter feed and it's on the AHR Twitter feed. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Ken underscore Sinclair. Uh, I post all of that, not as automated buildings. I, I post as Ken underscore Sinclair. So if you go there, you'll see that uh, there's a couple of versions of it. There's a version of uh, the original version, and then actually the, there's a formal uh, uh, 
apology from uh, uh, Lawrence that he was unable to make it. I think he still owns two Atlanta return tickets, so uh, I think he was pretty committed to come. Um, the next one I'm going to let uh, uh, Brad talk about because he's, and also what I want Brad to enter at this point, I want him to tell you about his journey. So my journey, uh, maybe I should start my journey a little bit further back too, as, as I worked as a energy automation consultant uh, for, I don't know, since 1975. Uh, and then I retired and started automated buildings 20 years ago. And obviously I need to retire again, but uh, the, so that, that was my journey. Uh, Brad has come into this, and, but is it the 11, 11 year, you're here, <laughs> 11 year mark. Uh, and so I'd like him to tell his journey. Actually, um, since you're here, uh, we, were, we were changing the program, so now that you're back, we'll <laughs> change it back again. Because <clears throat> you, you were the logical next person. Oh. Okay. So this is Therese Sullivan. Uh, and Therese and I met on the 15th anniversary of Automated Buildings. She came and helped me put together a collaboratory. And that forced her, I would like to use that word, to actually review all of the stuff we had done in the 15 years before. And uh, I think it uh, shaped her life terrifyingly. <laughs> Shaped my life. <laughs> That's right. So do you want to, do you want to speak from there or do you want to come to the podium? Um, sure, I'll come to the podium. Okay. I don't know if I can... Therese, Therese Sullivan of Tritium, right? Yes. Yeah. She, she has also many hats I never know, so you, you tell them who you are. <laughs> Therese Sullivan of Tritium. Um, right. I have been contributing to automated buildings now for about five years, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, Looking back, and that gave me a chance, as he said, to, to put together what we call the um, um, the long collaboratory that went on the 15 years um, prior to when I joined Automated Buildings as a contributing editor. And in that time, of course, um, the internet came into buildings, and you had companies like Tritium, where I work now, um, using that IT capability to um, come up with better interfaces, um, to take the uh, DDC and put a window into it, um, integrate data streams from all sorts of different sources, um, bring the open message of let's not have proprietary protocols, um, or if there are proprietary protocols, let's um, bring them all into one box, in our case, the JACE, um, which has kind of become a de facto industry operating system for buildings. Um, and. I was able to write about that a lot with, with Ken. I'm also based in Silicon Valley, so I worked for a lot of startup companies who kind of started looking at software companies, people that were coming out of Cisco and Oracle and saying, oh, buildings, you know, there's no technology in there. We'll bring them our technology. And um, they found out that it's, it, it, it's often very different. But So I worked for a series of Silicon Valley startups rework their technology for the buildings world. Didn't always work out as they thought it would, and also their, um, um, their span of time, their runway for succeeding, was on such shorter cycles um, than the traditional buildings world. So it was almost like two, two different clocks. And I think we're still dealing with that today, is the, um, the product life cycles for software and for the kind of technology going into buildings it's very fast. It's like on six-month cycles. We know we all have our phones, and we know how often they have to update the operating systems for security reasons, because a new feature function was discovered that everybody's using. You want to use this new app. You would never think of just putting your operating system in and in your phone and leaving it there forever. So this different um, view of the world from software, Silicon Valley, and from traditional buildings came crashing together, and that's what Ken often calls the convergence, um, and more officially called ITOT convergence, if, you know, operations technology meets information technology. And I've sort of been a little bit on the cusp of that. Um, so, you know, I know that we were gonna talk about um, emotion, and I think, or how buildings are, and that's what I was saying, per, we've, you, we've used all sorts of words to describe that leading up to today. Um, 
personalized spaces so that when a person comes in, uh, things adjust to who, um, you know, maybe a reading an RF code on their badge, um, what the lighting should be, what the temperature they like. That's been a goal. I think it's still in the future. We keep changing how we're calling it. <laughs> so it's personalized spaces. Now we're saying building emotion. But how that's, um, how that's going to happen is through software. And this transition the whole industry make, is making to speed up our idea of what a product life cycle should be, to step up to, um, especially in the security area, to step up to um, the need to uh, patch software, um, to add feature function as soon as demand comes, um, which means we've got to update software on six month cycles, not um, five year cycles. I, I think that's kind of where we are right now. So bringing the building emotion, bringing the, the new responsive building, responsive spaces is going to take things like um, tagging. I, the next session is going to be about tagging. <coughs> So that's the next IT thing that has to happen is things, if we want to get there, um, we're going to have to understand how to use tags, um, Haystack, Brickski. Actually, could you speak a little bit to the evolution of Haystack? Because you were quite involved in that as well. Right. Yeah, I was, you forgot, right? You <laughs> I <remember>. forgot. <laughs> I was editor of the Haystack Journal, um, which I still, it's got a brand new issue that's just coming out this week. I contributed two articles it, to. It, it's um, online today. I just tweeted it. Actually, the yeah. PDF is just online today. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, it's nice when you start those things and you see that, you know, even though you kind of shifted, it's continuing. And just the Haystack as an open source organization just seems to be gaining momentum, and the really great thing about Haystack, because um, I am from California, uh, Brick Schema it was very much supported by the UC, all the research laboratories at the University of uh, California, San Diego, UC um, Berkeley, were working on this other ontology um, called Brick Schema. Well, instead of doing the VHS Betamax, let's have a protocol war, and the people that suffer are the end consumers, um, Brick Schema, uh, Haystack, and um, the BACnet group itself had its own approach to tagging and ontologies that they were working on. Um, they too came and said, let's not have protocol war. Let's come together on this tagging thing. And those groups were still waiting to see what happens next. But um, I'm very proud. And I think it's about, not the magazine, you know, but just the communicate. Let's communicate about this. Let's not all work in little enclaves. Let's um, say what we're doing. It's because it's quite simple. Haystack is um, let's mark up uh, our data when we walk into a building. Let's not just call anything. Call a light a Lumiere or an uh, uh, LITE or a, you know. Let's first of all standardize on names, and then let's think about the schema as simple as what how we're going to describe a site, a piece of equipment, a point and how those relationships are working together. I mean, it's pretty, Haystack is pretty basic, but you have to start there to then build dictionaries for um, all the, you know, the special dictionaries for working with the grid and metering, um, how with those, you know, even the simple things I threw out there, site, um, equip, piece of equipment, um, point, how those are gonna be described um, when you're dealing with any kind of grid connected metering. Could I just interrupt here for a moment? Could we have a show of hands as who knows what Haystack is? Uh, good. So, well, I don't know. It's about, do it again. We're about 50-50. Okay. Uh, I just, we were, we're, you're kind of hitting in it at a fairly high level and I was wondering. Okay. So the next session is uh, an introduction to Haystack. So if you don't know, just stay in your chair and you soon will know all about Haystack. But uh, yes. but maybe if you could go way back, just back one one uh, one step back, and just how Haystack came to be. I think that was because uh, you were quite involved in that as well. So we're talking about the evolution is really our theme here. Right. How the these things happen. Of Haystack itself, actually, I was kind of brought up, and it was I think the people that started Tritium, actually, um, mm -hmm. Brian Frank. When you realized that you wanted an open integration platform. Uh, a building operating system, if you will, that was that could take in data streams from any brand of equipment and normalize that data so you could run queries against it. 
the next thing you realize is, the, is how important tagging is. And that comes right from Tim Berners-Lee and how, each, you know, how the internet was designed. Um, just like we on um, Twitter, because often I'm in, the, I'm in the back of the room tweeting rather than standing here. Um, and when I do Twitter, I do hashtag AHR2019. That's a tag. Um, likewise, when you're putting any data into your building, you want to tag it so that it can be qu later queried. And why do I do on Twitter hashtag AHR2019? Well, then whatever I'm saying um, on my tweet can be collected with everybody else that also did the same hashtag, and queries can run, be run against that. I mean, that's just how the internet's designed, right? Um, but the, the other thing, too, is there was a, a few leaders that came, came forward, uh, uh, you know, John Petsy and... Mark, uh, Mark Pitak, who yes. basically were involved, as you mentioned, with the tritium evolution, and I think we'd probably have to put J2 as uh, you know one of the early adopters, and and it actually made uh, this all work. Uh, it's it's a, a a very complex thing. Actually, one of the things John Petsy always describes it is it's you would if we didn't have html we all wouldn't be able to look at each other's website i mean basically stuff written in html it pops up and it comes into our browsers and basically the, the simple explanation of haystack is that if we all agree in, on a language to express all these points it should be as simple as that and we can go to any job we basically bring out those haystack tags and they pop up and they are in the browser now we can start doing things with them so anyway, it's a very intriguing topic. It's a, a necessary evolutionary piece in our industry, and it's really important. And like I say, the next session uh, steps you through. There's also a uh, event in San Diego in about mid-May. I don't have the exact dates off the top of my head, but uh, uh, so there's an actual. That would be what the fourth, fifth convention or something. What would you think? Yes, if they they happen every two years, and I think this would be. The fourth, <clears throat> yeah, the, the fourth um, Haystack Connect uh, in San Diego in May. And all these things, I think we keep looking backward and looking forward. You know, it, we're making a logical progression as an industry and looking backward to the founding, you know, why somebody, first of all, that would say, oh, we need a open operating system that everybody can recognize. Um, and that oh, thanks. they can develop upon. And the reason it's open is that it can take data streams from all brands of equipment, normalize that data, and make it possible to query against it and run visualizations of that. It was like, oh, that's, that's obvious. Um, and the next step was obvious is tagging. But I think as an industry, so we have to understand how that evolved. And we can also really understand where we're going to, that all those things to come back to my, the life cycle of those things are on like six month cycles because it's software and it's building industry. We're used to running things on seven year or 10 year cycles and things like the haystack tagging, they're moving really quickly. Um, so Niagara um, and the Tritium team is quickly incorporating the best of tagging. I mean, as I said, with these groups coming together, Brick Schema, um, the BACnet interest group that was working on tagging and Haystack on coming up with the next standard. Well, we'll be supporting that and we'll be, you know, modifying and adding um, functionality inside the um, Niagara framework to support that. Um, likewise, as Java applets move to HTML5, that was another big, you know, looking back, we, we're in the midst of that, right? Everything should be HTML5. That's just what, let's say, the millennials, what everybody expects um, an interface to be as responsive as an HTML5 interface. Um, those things are happening at a quick life cycle. Um, we're supporting that at a, at a quick life cycle. So the idea of thinking very transactionally, like I buy a piece of equipment, I put it there, it stays there for five years, and when I don't think about it, it's, it's not going to work anymore. It's got to be, you kind of got to step up the industry with things like uh, software maintenance agreements licensing contracts for software um, because you want to, you're, you're, you're putting, because to the topic of the thing of an emotional building, because rents, the value of rents are being um, set on how comfortable, how responsive, 
um, the, uh, the functionality of, of the whole building when they walk in the doors and the cameras are the, the latest things. That's the wow factor that's going to mean higher rents. People want to want to be here. Um, if you walk away from this needing to update all the time, you're not going to get those higher rents. So. Okay, well, we've got a bunch of other pieces of evolution here we've got to, uh, got to keep stepping through. So we'll, well, I think we'll ask you back after we uh, head through some of those. Uh, actually, uh, Ken just handed me the, uh, his phone, which is nice, thank you. Uh, the actual date of Haystack Connect is uh, May 13th to 15th in San Diego. Now, I think we're going to stop talking about Haystack because that's just one evolutionary piece that we have to get, get through. Um, the next, the next thing that sort of happened I, is we started moving away from uh, proprietary uh, systems, and I've got to admit that uh, uh, Tritium was, was the company that was uh, the harbinger of that uh, in the fact that they, they were able to support uh, BACnet and they were able to support uh, they have probably more drivers than any other. That's just, probably 166. 166 drivers. <laughs> there you go. We're not supposed to be hyping products, here. but but Tritium is Tritium is sometimes sometimes almost beyond the product. It's a uh, it's like a ecosystem, I think. But anyway, what we're seeing now is a new evolution in open systems, and I'm going to have Brad speak to that. I also want Brad to kind of uh, start with his his uh, take on how he got into this industry. So <clears throat> I just I just lived forever, so it was an easy exit in, entrance for me. Uh, <clears throat> Therese came in at the request to, to help me document 15 years of uh, blur that had occurred. And then probably about five years later, uh, at what was it, was Connect Connectivity Week, I think uh, we had a program and we brought in young people uh, Young Energy, and uh, Brad was one of those Young Energy people, as was Alper, uh, uh, what's the trouble with this last name? Old Mesler. Uh, Old Mesler. Old Mesler. Old Mesler. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, Old Mesler. Old Mesler. <laughs> Mesler. Mesler. Okay, good. Anyway, Alper. Everybody knows him as Alper. But anyway, so these, these two guys that, uh, that appeared on the scene about 11 years ago have made radical changes, and... Uh, Mr. Radical Change, do you want to come up here? And you sure. Speak with podium, or you want to speak to me? You might as well speak. I'll use the podium. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, so I, I guess I kind of took over Ken's life as a energy and automation consultant um, when he transitioned to something else. Um, and I think you know, Therese touched on it, but you know, one thing that's that's interesting about our industry is you kind of still see the you know the past fifteen years out in the field. I mean, we, we work predominantly in existing buildings and I, you, know, you can walk into buildings and, and still see proprietary protocols, still see pneumatic to DDC interfaces. I mean, all of that stuff is still out there. Um, so the, you know, to see the evolution, you just need to walk through a couple of existing buildings and, and you'll actually see you know, the last 15 years of hardware um, right there in front of you. And, and I guess when I came into the industry, you know, I, I, I called maybe the backnet wars had been fought and won, and, and you know at that point backnet seemed to be you know the thing, and it was accepted, and, and no one questioned that anymore. But even then, you know we were still accessing sites with by a dial-up modem, uh, and going in through, you know, to, to proprietary older systems, and and you know most of those have gone away now, um, and, and you know but you know at the time there was a lot of talk of the transition to to web interfaces. But I have to say, most of them were terrible, and we didn't use them because, you know, as, as much as you can kind of see the promise and the potential, um, you know, it took a while for the technology to catch up. And I, I think that's one theme that I've seen repeatedly, you know, in this industry is that, you know, even even with Haystack, I would say the vast majority of systems we're still putting in today don't necessarily come with Haystack out of the box. Uh, a lot of manufacturers still haven't incorporated it. Um, even though there's obviously value there to doing so, um, it's not at the point yet where it's universally, uh, you know, applied and accepted. Certainly, the leaders are, and, and that that's where the trend in the industry is going. But I, I would say, you know, it takes a long time for for this industry to kind of catch up to things. But I think that time is is I see that really shortening as well. Um, and it, you know, I look at things like data analytics. Well, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about the promise of potential data anal analytics. I think that is a, something that's been very quickly adopted by the industry. 
Um, and I think part of the reason for that is it's mostly a software solution um, because you know the hardware may have a lifespan of you know 10, 15 years in our buildings, but if you can start to provide these software solutions that lay on top of that, well, those, as Therese said, you know, the life cycle software is very fast. Um, and so I think now once our, our, our building systems, the hardware got to the point where it could support some of these software solutions, I think we're at that point now where we can go to pretty much any system um, and plug into it and pull the data out of it and run it into a um, any, any kind of software app or analytics solution that we want. And I think this is where kind of the open systems comes in. Um, and, and that's where, you know, in our practice as consultants, we're using open systems because, you know, we kind of got burned a few times buying commercial solutions off the shelf for acquiring data from our building automation systems. Of course, every every vendor has, has their own solution, but, you know, we found them often to be too expensive and there were some low cost solutions on the market, but they'd, you know, they'd come and go in a year or two. Um, and so what, what we hit on is kind of the solution to that problem for us. And, you know, talking to others in, in the industry, they're seeing something similar is um, with open solutions and, and open source. It's something that, you know, we as a small consulting company can take this open source software, put it on a very inexpensive piece of hardware. And then we have a solution that we can control and we can go into a building and suddenly now we're not beholden to the integrator or the controls contractor um, or another another service provider, um, and, and that's really liberating, and, and that we see that as being a big game changer. And then once we have access to the data, then of course we can kind of push that to to any kind of software, whether it be open source analytics tools which are out there, whether it be commercial um, analytics tools, whether it be visualization platforms, all, all kinds of emerging applications for that data. Um, but you know, open source is, is seeming to be a, a path. Of, path there. But when we talk about open solutions, we're not talking just about open source. We're also talking about, you know, I, I, one of the things we'll be talking about is how do you, how do you define open? But, you know, what we said, you know, the open solutions is really about transparency, about being able to access what the information that's in there. And if, if you, you know, look at the IT industry, that's about, you know, having open APIs. So you can have an API that you can go in and exchange data with another piece of software or another system. And pull all of that data over, over to your, your solution. And I think that's where we see the building automation system going is uh, that you know, more and more our software is going to be open in terms of the APIs. You'll be able to push and pull data. And this is more than just, you know, BACnet was I think the first step in that direction, but now we're talking about much more. It, it's, you know, as, as one of our panelists, I think um, Calvin said, you know, he, he's an integrator and he said, you know what, we need to see more than just points, uh, which is what BACnet gives you points and objects. We need, we need to be able to see what's going on inside these systems. And that, that's where we see uh, open solutions going. Because once we can really see what's going on in, inside, then we can, we can do more meaningful things with, with that information. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where, where we're at. Open hardware? Didn't mention that. Yeah, open hardware. Well, that, that's another aspect of it, of it too. And uh, we'll be talking about um, you know, things like Raspberry Pis. Um, and we see some of the major control, uh, control vendors, um, you know, contemporary controls being one of them, where they're, they've got a modified Raspberry Pi um, that they've kind of done up for, for the building automation industry, where it's you know, got 24 volt power and it's got the right DIN rail mounting system. And you know, it looks like any other controller, but the hardware is a Raspberry Pi. Um, which is, you know, they're like 35 bucks off the shelf. And, and so that, that's another direction and it's running, you know, uh, you know, Debian operating system uh, on it. And, and, you know, they've been able to, you know, they'll give you a kit that comes with an open Sedona programming language, but you can also pretty much do whatever you want with it um, because it's, it's hard to Raspberry Pi. So you can, um, we're looking at things like putting it on our uh, open source data acquisition software uh, can run on it. And, and, you know, it was interesting, you know, the description of, of this very inexpensive Raspberry Pi said, you know, it's got as much power in the hardware as some of the, you know, high, like some of the JSE boxes um, and, and things like that and, and coming in a real, a real different package. And, and so I think it's um, folks like, you know, Calvin who are, you know, integrators um, are, I think, you see them getting very excited about what they can do with some of this open hardware. And, and you know, certainly, you know, the controllers we see today, they're not going to go away anytime soon, but, you know, we're going to start to see these new pieces of hardware come in that uh, have very, very different set of capabilities. And you know, I don't think the day is very far away when we're starting to script building automation system sequences in, in something like Python, uh, which is kind of more, more of an open, open language that a lot of people know rather than, you know, proprietary, you know, specialized niche um, coding languages that, that only our industry knows. And, and that's going to be a game changer because then, you know, folks, it makes it easier for people from, you know, an IT background or a software engineering background 
that maybe don't have that specialized building automation knowledge, you know, easier for them to kind of come into our industry. And I think that that's going to drive further change. Do you do your session? Yes, uh, noon hour, right here. Um, it'll it, it'll be interesting because we've got you know a, a panel of um, hardware manufacturers, integrators, um, and you know all with a very different perspective on on what open is. Um, you know, in, in terms of their, their industries and you know open open source, but also just open. Uh, open proprietary, we'll, we'll call it, um, which is uh, not uh, not as much of an oxymoron as, as it sounds. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. So what, I, what I've learned of 50 years in the control industry is that we always have to keep growing. And as I'm ending uh, near the end of my best, coming closer to my best buy date, I, uh, I keep worrying about how we're going to uh, reconfigure this industry, and uh, uh, so it, it, it is necessary that we all learn how to grow younger, and of course we physically can't do that, but the only way we can do that is through the eyes of these younger people. And uh, these, these, this group of uh, folks here are my new contributing editors, and uh, as I talked funny when I came into the industry, and nobody understood and I was talking about microprocessors. They're talking about small form uh, PCs and basically two inches by two inches that are becoming part of edge devices and uh, it's a whole new language. And the only way that we can grow younger is to reach out, grab yourself a younger mentor or start reading the writings of my younger contributing editors. And it's, it's, a, it's amazing. You just hang with them and you learn stuff. You're, you're, writing, you're writing down a, a phone number and they take a picture of it, you, you idiot. <laughs> and it's, it's just stuff that uh, we grew up in a time and uh, times are changing. We're not digitally native and we need, have to learn how to become uh, digitally native. Okay, we have uh, a bunch of other evolutionary pieces in this uh, cycle and uh, <clears throat> after uh, after the open session, we have our uh, changing collaborative connection communities. And uh, this is our seventh uh, year that we've got this, uh, our connection community collaboratory going. We started seven years ago, it was actually Mark Pedock and I think we we're in Chicago and we were trying to figure out what we should call ourselves as an industry. And we kind of came to the conclusion that all we really do is connect stuff whether we're connecting temperature sensors or we're connecting dampers or BAV boxes, uh, just all these pieces. And so we are in the connection industry. Uh, so we got together and we just started talking in this collaboratory and it was, it's, it was a slow start and there was just a few, a few of us and uh, it keeps building and we keep getting more and more folks involved uh, and we're looking forward. So this year I've thrown on top of all of the things that we need to connect is the humans. And so that's another piece that we need to add to this uh, connection. And it's becoming a more important piece with my theme of uh, building emotion, where it's really all about how do we connect the people. And so I'm hoping that each one of them will give me a little bit of a take. Plus, they, they, always, they always give me an, an unsolicited take of what they see going on, which is really good. So the format is they both all get to do a five minute uh, a blurb of what's going on in the industry. And then we open it up to the floor and it's in the same room. So we have a, a mic that you can come up and, and add your uh, uh, point to it. So we hope you'll enjoy, uh, join us in that. So that's at 1.30. Oh, you don't have that. We're missing one slide here, which is another evolutionary step that has occurred in our industry, which is the master systems integrator. So what happened is as the folks started to come out of their proprietary systems and started to enter the world of open systems and they started to mesh together several vendor systems, there became a, I think it evolved that first systems integrators, the model used to be is they were all belonged to a proprietary camp and they rep repped a vendor. Then what happened is they started getting big projects and they would come to a university and the university would be of a particular vendor that was not their vendor. And so they would, but they were the trusted uh, installer. So they basically got to install the system. 
And so they started working with multi-vendors. They became system integrators by definition. <laughs> and then that started moving up rapidly into integrating just almost everything. We started uh, cameras uh, and they became master systems integrators. The session this year is super master systems integrators because they are, they are suffering from functional creep. Every time they touch it and every time they do a good job of actually integrating a whole bunch of stuff into buildings, whether it's sound systems, whether it's video, whether it's uh, and now we're on the edge of people and we're in social network and, and all of this stuff is starting to come in. So we're basically the data architect for the, uh, for the building and how we gather that. So that's an interesting session as well. So that's falling after this one. So we have this room, if you actually just sat in this room all, uh, all day, you would, uh, it would be a continuation of, of the 20 year evolution that we, we started at the uh, beginning of this. Now, is there anything, so where are we at here? So we got about 10 minutes left. You guys wanna do anything in summation or is there anything, anybody, burning questions anybody's got from the floor that they would like to ask? Okay. Uh, we're going to keep talking then. <laughs> um, what's best is uh, a, a bunch of things buzzing around in my mind here, but I'm not sure which is is uh, most valuable. We should. Yeah, can, can I have a question? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I've been an open system proponent since '98, '99. Yeah, good. And 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 the. Uh, I know that there's a big move and you brought up Python. And the concern that I have is, is that in the old days, back when you and I didn't have so much gray hair, um, we, we, were, we, were, we were talking about the proprietary systems that were the big four, big five, whoever, Johnson, Honeywell, Powers, whoever it was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and they were closed because they had licensed software that you had to have to work on those systems. Well, it's almost like it feels in some ways that we've gone a little bit full circle in the fact that every integrator has a unique approach to tying all of these things together. So, so do you see, I know the Haystack is a big, is a big thing, but, but for instance, if I take off with an HTML5 coder and create this wonderful operator interface that my guy knows how to do, mm -hmm. and he's got the code, and yet it's, it's open, but he's the guy that how made the wires work. What do you see that's happening or evolving in the industry that's going to kind of combat that to make it so that it really is more like the internet? Okay, that, thank you. That's a great question. <clears throat> Plus, you uh, you basically uh, got me on stalled there. Uh, the uh, this whole thing I've been talking about is the uh, wrote an article talking about the proprietary telling tales and uh, it depends on how you spell that. Uh, but what's happening is they've got bigger people breathing fire on uh, their tails. I think it's Nicholas, he calls them the proprietary dragons, which is a, a good, good definition. But what we've got is we've got the evolution of Google, the evolution of Amazon uh, are moving and they're coming and they're coming with this human uh, connection a lot better than we are. They, they, that's basically, their hook and handle is they are coming complete with the, you know, their, their connection to our phones. So what they're doing is they're putting pressure, Amazon services, Amazon web services is putting pressure on the proprietary folks to start using some of their services because they're so cheap, they're so amazing. And by the way, do you want a voice interface? That's, that's an integral part of what we're providing. And so they're forcing that, and we're starting to see that ripple through to some of our products. And uh, it's, it's kind of an amazing transition. So our industry is going to be driven by the, the Amazons, the uh, uh, Googles, and Microsoft is, is making an amazing recovery in my mind. I've got some uh, self-learning algorithms. Uh, what I'm sort of seeing is the proprietary uh, Giants are using open source to catch up, but they don't want to be open. So it's kind of an interesting situation. They kind of scoop up all of this stuff to, to get as far ahead as they can. And then they somehow try to figure out how can we keep playing our proprietary game. 
So I think the pressure is going to have to come from consultants and owners to actually open up some of this uh, uh, connections. And uh, I think the bigger pressure will come from uh, just from the from the uh, software folks. They just, they're just such such monsters. They're not open standards, but you cannot say that you cannot do something and ignore ignore what Amazon is doing. And the idea that they are connecting us to their uh, their financial model is interesting. That it's it gets us into the situation that a voice interface. We may be at the situation in the near future where they actually pay us to put their voice interface into our products. That's kind of a head shake, uh, you know, thought. I think uh, we have to kind of uh, kind of evolve. Uh, Zina, you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, t I'll take a stab at that too. Um, and, and so I think, you know, in, all, in, in the future evolution, I think we can kind of look back on, you know, what happened in the IT industry and, and the way, you know, that has evolved. Um, and I think, you know, the step, there, there's a few pieces that need to come together. And I don't think we're anywhere close today to the point where, you know, we won't have people kind of doing their own thing and putting together. I think that's, that's going to be the case and that'll probably be the case for, for a little while. And, and I mean, if you look back, I mean, that was the case in the early days of the web too. I mean, every web page was put together a little bit differently. Um, but I think, you know, when the pieces like open hardware, or, you know, let's take the Raspberry Pi, for example, comes in that, you know, that's, that's an important piece because all of a sudden it can run. It's not locked to one piece of software. Sure. You can put Sedona on it, but you, you can not put Sedona on it and put something else on it. Uh, you, can Amazon put, web services, you can put Amazon Web Services, you can put, um, you know, we're, we're using Voltron, which is a DOE developed open source software for data acquisition. You could put, you could just, you know, use other, any, any tool you want. Um, and I think that's, that's going to lead to things like, you know, if you, if you look at how web pages are, are created today, uh, I mean, there's no one standard, but there's kind of de facto thing, you know, like WordPress. WordPress is almost a universal thing in terms of how people are creating websites. And there's alternatives to WordPress. Not everything is WordPress, but a lot of people use WordPress. And I think what you're going to see is once the hardware starts to open up, you're going to have people starting to develop platforms that are akin to WordPress. And so you might have someone develop a platform for creating a building automation system front end. Every front end, just like every web page, is still going to look a little bit different and there's going to be customized elements, but it's going to be created on a common framework. Um, and I think that's kind of where this is going to go. And, it's, and, and that's a framework you'll be able to, it's not like every time you get a new PC, you don't have to build a new web page. So, you know, I think once the hardware starts to open up, you know, you'll be able to, you know, switch hardware, put the same software back on it, or you may decide to switch hardwares. And that doesn't mean you have, or switch software, sorry. And, and you know, the, you want to migrate from WordPress to, to Squarespace or something like, like that. And, and, you know, you don't have to buy a new computer to do that. So I think we're going to see the kind of the unlocking of the hardware and the software, which is still today very locked. I mean, you've got most controlled manufacturers, you can only program it with their software. Um, that day, I think it's going to come to an end, um, maybe not quickly, but I think over the next five to 10 years, certainly, and you'll start to see elements. So I think, you know, five years from now, you'll be able to put together a full control system. that's all open hardware and open software. Um, and you will still have systems out there that are proprietary, but you'll start to see that shift in the market with, I think the progressive integrators and, and that's the direction I see it going in. If you want to physically see this, go out to the contemporary booth and have Zach put a hat on a raspberry. And and that's what he, that's what they call it is basically there's the Raspberry computer which is the thirty five dollar computer you buy and then they put hats on it and what the hat is is it's a plug in board that fits on the top and basically his I O is on on that on the hat what did the hat stands for um, hardware on top or Hard hardware added on top or something yeah, hat, yeah hardware added on top okay so so we're taking these standard PCs that are just like our laptops except they're this big and that's the that's the base of it and then you start plugging hats on and then you start to build so this is going to be the new way of building controllers even for the majors and they're not going to be able to uh, you know as it turns out as an industry what we do extremely well is we basically we build bulletproof IO we've been doing that for 20 30 years in the DDC industry we figured out early that if we had sort of IT IO and you basically start up a 300 horse uh, motor and the inductance inside, it starts everything in the building. And I think we've all had that experience. So basically hardened IO and, and connections and how to connect that to physical devices 
That's our industry. And I don't think we should fight as the, how the processing is done because the processing is changing daily and the, the power and the price of raspberries are dropping. And we keep talking raspberries, but of course there's beagle boards. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, small form PCs that are coming. And what's happening is uh, uh, Calvin just uh, linked, gave me a LinkedIn file on a, on a hat for one of these devices. And it basically had uh, self-learning, a self-learning app. So you take a, this thing and you plug it in that. So what's happening now is people develop these modules, either being hardware or being logic, and they have them plug in. And then they somewhat can even stack them. So basically, you mix and match. And that's the way it's going to do. So the hardware is starting to come into some kind of standards. They're looking for the volume. And as an industry, we've always, we've always suffered by not having enough volume because we made specialized controls for specialized purposes. But if we can take generalized controls and make them special for our own services, I think that is going to be our evolutionary uh, future. Yep. I was, you know, as a summary thought, I think it's about community. Everything that you're talking here, I see John Petsy in the other um, corner of the room, and what Haystack did, and really what um, Automated Buildings has done, is they've created community. And developers, we're, living, uh, we're moving into a world where everybody should know a little bit about development. Um, every, and how we're doing that, one of your favorite words, Ken, autodidactic, but how do people teach themselves? They form a community and they learn from each other. And the vibrancy of the Haystack community and maybe Automated Buildings um, readership it's from each other. And if any of these ideas like Python on Raspberry Pi or hats on um, something else hats is on hats on, <laughs> yes, on beagle boards, unless it forges a community, unless you can say, hey, you know, I'm a genius, I sit in my room by myself and I create this one thing, that's great. But unless you can communicate about it and form an, um, a community of practice, you don't really have anything. And I think that's the challenge. Excellent closing remarks. Excellent closing remarks. Yeah, you want to come up?